Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is a very full room and more people than we expected. It's also the uh, next to the last day of classes, so I presume that students are just looking for uh, their last uh, free lunches uh, before they depart for the summer. So good afternoon uh, from Chicago, and thank you all for joining us both here in person and uh, on our live stream. My name is Chris Wheat. I'm executive director of the Stiegler Center for the study of the economy and the state here at Chicago Booth. We're very happy to host a panel conversation on the forces facing uh, the political economy across the globe with five international journalists from the Stiegler Center's uh, 2023 Journalist in Residence Program, moderated by Pro Markets Brooke Fox. Before we begin, please note we are live streaming the event and it will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel. Uh, for those of you in the room, we will have uh, some time towards the end uh, for questions, so we ask that you hold your questions until then and then Brooke will call on you. Uh, and as usual, the views expressed by guests are their own uh, and not of the Stigler Center or the University of Chicago. We hope you'll join us uh, for the, some more upcoming events uh, throughout this month and the summer, including the second installment of our Unpacking ESG uh, series in collaboration with the Rustandi Center for Social Innovation and the Financial Times, which will happen on June 14th. You can check out our website for more details on that event and others, as well as the Stigler Center's digital publication, promarket.org, and the Capitalism uh, podcast. For those of you who aren't familiar uh, with the program, the Journalist in Residence program, uh, we're in our sixth year, invite journalists from uh, around the country and around the world to spend a quarter here at the university, uh, taking courses, learning from faculty, and also learning from uh, students and the campus community uh, as well. You can learn more uh, about our program on our website. Uh, we will also be opening up uh, our application in the late summer uh, for our 2024 cohort. Uh, and now please allow me to very briefly introduce our speakers. The nice thing about having a diverse array of journalists from around the world is that it gives me a chance to butcher uh, several names. Uh, so please forgive me uh, in advance. Uh, to my right is James McIntosh, a columnist at the Wall Street Journal based in London. Uh, next to James is Dasha Antonik. I wasn't even close. Almost. Okay, thank you. Uh, a freelance reporter for the record and the Kyiv Independent based in Kyiv, Ukraine. Uh, Taimura Hassan is a business reporter at Profit Magazine based in Lahore, Pakistan. Um, Patrick, uh, Patrick Uwegu uh, is an independent investigative journalist based out of Toronto, uh, who is originally from Nigeria. Uh, Julius Bizimgu yes, okay. uh, <laughs> is a senior producer at CNBC Africa and a contributing writer for Forbes Afri uh, Africa Magazine, who is based in Rwanda. And our moderator today is Brooke Fox. Brooke is managing editor of the Stiegler Center's uh, digital publication, Pro Market and is a member of the inaugural 2017 journalist, uh, journalist in Residence cohort. And without further ado, uh, Brooke, let me turn it over to you. Great, thanks Chris. Um, I think this is a really cool thing that we get to do today. Uh, it's one of my favorite events because we get to hear from perspectives outside our own country, which is not always something that a lot of us seek out. Um, we have a lot of topics to get to and not a ton of time. Um, and so I'd really just like to jump right in. Um, just an FYI to the folks on the panel, I might cut you off after two, three minutes just to make sure that we can get to each perspective and each topic. Um, so just be aware of that. I feel like we need to start with uh, Ukraine or Pakistan given the current events. So which of you would like to go first? You can do it. You can? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, well, <laughs> where to begin? Um, today's news was that uh, Ukraine said that it shot down 29 out of 30 Russian missiles. Um, many people today are asking whether Ukraine has finally begun to launch a counteroffensive or, uh, as reported recently in Politico, whether the war will turn into a quote unquote frozen conflict, uh, which means that one side or the other will not be declared a victor, but the fighting will sort of stall out and come to an end. Um, I'm curious which way you think the war will go. Um, and let's just start with that question. Yeah, many people ask Ukrainians about counteroffensive, but the good thing about counteroffensive, it should cut your enemy by surprise. So even if Ukraine studied it, probably we will learn about it later. And another thing, 
to remember the one counteroffensive it doesn't determine the outcomes of the war. So the war will definitely continue after this counteroffensive, uh, regardless of what will be the results and how much territory Ukraine uh, will regain. The only thing I know for sure that Ukraine will never accept any peace proposals that say that it should give up some of its territories or that the conflict will freeze because we were fighting for a year and actually for many years since 2014 uh, to regain our territory which were illegally occupied and freezing of the conflict means that all of these efforts were wasted all of the international support Ukraine received from its partners it were for nothing of course I know that uh, some leaked documents say that US officials consider uh, the war turning into the frozen conflict. But for now, I see that hot stage is more important for us. Uh, Ukrainian military uh, is training abroad. It receives more weapons from its partners, and it's ready for the hot stage. So I guess Ukraine will stay in this stage for as long as it can, and hopefully with the support of international partners, uh, it will help us win the war without turning it into the frozen conflict. Yeah. Um Last year, we hosted this event actually specifically because the invasion of Ukraine was, I think, about, it had happened about a month or two um, prior to this particular event. But last year, we didn't have any journalists uh, from Ukraine. Um, and yet, we were all talking about the impacts of the war uh, internationally in terms of sanctions, in terms of global trade. And at that time, we weren't sure if there was going to be a global food shortage, etc. What we didn't talk about uh, was the impact on Ukraine's economy, and we didn't have the opportunity to hear from anyone from Ukraine on that topic. So I wondered if you could give us uh, some insight as to what that looks like right now. Well, in terms of economics, not great. Ukraine lost 30% of its GDP. Um, the total damage to its infrastructure and to territory, approximately $700 billion. And but actually the economic uh, outlooks for the future, they look positive. Uh, for instance, Ukraine's National Bank released a report a few days ago saying that GDP will continue to grow, the inflation will slow down, the rise of prices will also slow down, thanks, of course, to the international support and also to the um, growing energy sector, because maybe if you follow events in Ukraine, Russia's goal in winter was to cut Ukraine off the energy. Every day we had blackouts, which lasted from four to six hours, uh, four or three times a day. It means for the whole day we didn't have internet, uh, light, sometimes even water, um, and the attacks were continuous. But thanks to all of the air defense system we received, oh, we managed to shot all of the, mo almost all of the missiles and uh, Ukrainian uh, energy workers uh, managed to repair the systems quickly, so our energy system is functioning right now. It is ready to even to export the surplus of energy abroad. Uh, so thanks to these factors, international support, um, the revival of energy system, uh, we probably see some improvements in our economic situation. Yeah, I remember when we interviewed you for this program, you started the interview oh apologizing if, the, if there was a blackout in the middle yeah. of the interview, and it was sort of like, you don't yeah. have to apologize for that. Um, but good to know that, uh, that everyone's okay. Um, okay, let's move to Pakistan. Uh, I, I was listening to um, the NPR up first this morning, and they were talking about how the political situation has escalated uh, with the former, the former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Um, he's currently being targeted by the military, um, despite protests and support from many Pakistani civilians. Um, I wondered if you could uh, briefly, Taimur, explain the political crisis to those who haven't uh, kept up with what's happening. Obviously, it's a quickly moving situation. Um, and then uh, we'll sort of ask you about the impacts that it's had on the on the Pakistani economy. Sure. Uh, so the current political crisis in Pakistan, uh, so it's, it's right now it's um, chaotic and I must come with full disclosures that it's nothing new for us. It's, it's been like that for you know decades now. Um, but the recent political whatever is happening in Pakistan also has its origin in the Ukraine war. Um, this guy Imran Khan, he went to uh, 
Russia the day Russia invaded Ukraine um, to sign a two billion dollar uh, energy deal for just like to, get, uh, to buy cheap energy from Russia for Pakistan's energy ne uh, needs, and he probably did not know that Russia would have invaded uh, Ukraine on the same day. So this guy comes back, and the U.S. was very harsh with Pakistan because um, Russia is under sanctions right now. Um, and there were other factors brewing as well that uh, he wanted to appoint his favorites uh, to the military high command. So this guy was actually deposed in a no-confidence vote. He, he was never a um, weak prime. Uh, he was never a strong prime minister anyway. He was. It was a hung parliament. It was. A, he had a very thin majority, so he very easily uh, lost the no-confidence vote and was booted out of office. We say booted because it's the military boots that we uh, claim. Uh, the people who were behind his ouster. So this guy says that uh, it was a U.S. conspiracy because he went to Russia uh, to get this uh, the cheap oil. So this is uh, you know the origin actually. There are multiple factors. It has come to this point now that people have taken to the streets, but um, it's bad right now because Imran Khan did to his opponents. He's getting. He's actually getting it back. What he did to his opponents when he was in power, he threw threw everyone in jail. He annoyed literally everyone. He kept his opponents for uh, in jail for seven months, and now that the military has deposed him and uh, put the others in power, they're doing the same to him. Mm -hmm. So the eventual loss is, you know, and this guy he has a big ego, honestly, because he's he cannot take it that he was you know booted out of power. So I think that is what it's all about right now. And he has support, it's a few million people, and he's trying to take on a few million people, uh, on, on everyone, literally all the power stakeholders on the back of only a few million people, mm -hmm. and I don't think that is going to work. So. Um, what is the, so, so, and you have to explain a little bit, I've read about rising inflation in Pakistan, uh, people are having trouble getting, you know, affording like daily meals, um, can you can you talk a little bit more about that? So it, it, it goes back to the pandemic. You know, because of the pandemic, there was a um, huge production cut. Pakistan's GDP is going at only 0.4% for this year. Um, and then the Ukraine war, because uh, Pakistan imports most of its um, oil from the Middle East and Russia, uh, sorry, uh, Ukraine and Russia. So um, because the input was cut, there's been a lot of inflation, the dollar has been uh, appreciating against the rupee, the rupee has gone down, and the, uh, we actually need a lot of financing. Most of our Pakistan's budget actually goes to debt financing. So about 60% uh, is uh, of the Pakistan's budget goes to repayment of uh, dues, of the loans. So there's literally like nothing that, that is left for development. For, uh, and so in, in during the COVID, Pakistan had to like give a relief package. So there's like a lot of structural problems in Pakistan's economy and the rising inflation, uh, there was COVID, there was Ukraine war. So <clears throat> Pakistan has not been able to like stabilize that because of all the political chaos um, is at, actually at the crux because Pakistan needs IMF bailout. There's a political uncertainty. Nobody knows when the elections are going to happen so that they can renegotiate deal with the lenders, So, which is why everything is uncertain. So as soon as new elections happen, a new government is formed, they'll be able to renegotiate deals with the IMF. The dollar will come down. Inflation will also likely come down. Okay, yeah. No, it's interesting that you talk about Ukraine and the pandemic because um, that was initially going to be my first question to everyone. Uh, how were your countries affected both by the war in Ukraine and by the p pandemic? Because as we know, um, you know, uh, m macro events uh, globally impact your economy. So I want to shift it uh, this way to Julius. Um, maybe you can start by talking about how those two major um, global events have impacted uh, the economy. Right. Uh, thank you, Brooke. Um, uh, Starting with the pandemic, I think um, um, when the pandemic hit, um, I think that two stories here, just like every other country, 
Africa has been hard, hit you know, very hard. Um, and the two stories, there's a positive story and there's a negative story. Um, I remember the first country in Africa that detected uh, the COVID case was, I think, Egypt um, in February 2020. And uh, Everybody was really worried uh, what was going to happen to healthcare systems uh, because, you know, for some of you who probably know, healthcare systems in Africa are very fragile. And uh, uh, but surprisingly, we saw uh, when the pandemic started that most African countries actually took drastic measures. Uh, uh, you know, it took about temporary closure of you know things like schools, hospital. I mean, uh, schools public offices and private offices, businesses, uh, but also trying to raise awareness around, you know, public health measures, um, you know, such as avoiding handshakes, uh, exercising, uh, social distancing, and uh, um, um, other measures. And we saw some of the countries really becoming uh, innovative in the way they dealt with the pandemic, uh, especially the use of technology. Uh, so some countries really uh, uh, using robots, for instance, to uh, uh, to screen uh, for COVID cases, uh, uh, the use of solar power, uh, uh, hand washing stations, uh, the use of mobile applications to uh, trace contacts, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, having said that, uh, I think uh, in the beginning, that in the past two uh, two years, we saw. Uh, uh, the pandemic becoming really intense because uh, most people died. Uh, and I think uh, in, in 2021, we saw around uh, 970 people dying almost every day uh, from the pandemic uh, across Africa. Uh, and I think by mid last year, the death toll had reached uh, around 250,000 people uh, dying from the pandemic. Uh, and mostly that is the case because, as I said, uh, most, most healthcare systems in Africa are very fragile. Uh, you have fewer doctors, you have fewer hospital beds, uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, no specialization in medicines. Uh, there's no capability in doing uh, timely research, uh, you know, in the healthcare system. Um, the other thing also that I feel was uh, important in the pandemic story is uh, the vaccines because uh, I remember reporting a lot about how the world, you know, mostly uh, the developed world and companies like Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca was right, were racing to build vaccines. Uh, and finally seeing countries like the US, the UK, uh, starting to uh, giving these vaccines to their uh, uh, people. What was shocking, I remember sometime, uh, you know, going home and my little cousins asking me, you've been talking about, uh, we've been watching you on TV talking about vaccines almost every other month, but we don't see that happening here. What's going on? Um, there was a really harsh reality that most rich countries were actually holding uh, vaccines. And so uh, as a result, it took so many, many months for Africa to access vaccines. And uh, as a result, you saw you know, millions of people dying. There's, I think, one, ca one study that came out uh, in 2022 saying at least more than one million pe lives could have, might have been saved if rich nations had shared vaccines more equitably with lower developing uh, countries. Uh, the key lesson, uh, you know, uh, what I would say, the key lesson from here is that I think African countries are now learning that uh, it is very important to, you know, uh, increase public spending uh, for healthcare, uh, but also uh, to be able to attract more private sector investments um, uh, uh, in the sector to build really resilience uh, within their healthcare systems. And um, um, since then, I think we've seen countries like Rwanda, countries like Ghana, um, South Africa, Senegal, really coming out to start developing uh, vaccine manufacturing projects. Uh, I think in my country, Rwanda, uh, the government is now collaborating with uh, BioNTech to 
uh, develop the first mRNA uh, vaccine manufacturing implant. Uh, the same is happening in Senegal. Um, and I think uh, when it comes to investments, there's a very big market. Uh, just to be clear, I'm not an investment advisor, but people who want to invest the the vaccine man, uh, you know, market alone, I think, for existing and new products is you know expected to range from somewhere around 2.7 billion dollars to around 5.9 billion dollars up 20, 2040. Yeah, you, Patrick, yeah. Would you? Agree? Would did, did things go differently in Nigeria? How did how did? Yeah, so I think I'm gonna um, mention. Um, I mean, um, I'm gonna mention a bit about Ukraine and I mean how yeah. the pandemic played out in in yeah. my country. So okay. I mean, um, Nigeria and other countries in Africa um, heavily depend on Ukraine for grains and wheat. Yeah, I remember uh, there was concern at the beginning of the pandemic exactly. that there would be a food shortage. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, there was actually a food shortage um, because um, of the invasion. I, I remember, I mean, um, at the beginning of the invasion, um, the United Nations um, um, estimated that more than 40 million people um, in sub-Saharan Africa would, you know, face um, food insecurity. Um, so, I mean, we know the war... Um, affected, you know, um, distribution and supply of grain and wheat um, to Africa and specifically my country. So it's kind of affected, um, you know, in a big way. And um, but I mean, it, it's beginning to slow down. You know, um, Ukraine is beginning to, you know, export even um, amid the war to Africa and also my country. Um, then regarding the pandemic, um, um, just like Julio said. Um, African countries um, kind of um, did their best in tackling the pandemic, especially when, uh, you know, um, at the earlier stages of the pandemic, like, you know, during the lockdowns. And so in Nigeria, for example, we have also a fragile um, healthcare system. Um, if I'm correct, I think we have one doctor for 30 people. I mean, that's the ratio, I think. So we have lots of doctors. Um, in Nigeria, you know, migrating abroad, moving to the UK, to the US, because I mean, where they have better facilities, and I mean, the government back in Nigeria is not willing to invest in you know healthcare, so it's kind of affected during the uh, you know early stages of the pandemic. But um, I mean, doctors and you know healthcare workers still responded and did their best, um, um, you know, in responding to the pandemic. But I'm also, I, I must say that the pandemic affected um, um, food production and supply in Nigeria. I mean, um, these two channels were disrupted because, I mean, during the lockdown, everybody, smallholder farmers and small businesses were all locked down. You know, we are all at home. They couldn't go to the farm. They couldn't produce. So it's really affected even the country's GDP um, and all that. But so with, with help from developing up from developed countries like the UK, um, the US, you know, with vaccines and, you know, other expertise, it kind of helps Nigeria to respond um, to the pandemic. And that was why Nigeria, um, Nigeria, Ghana, um, I think Senegal, Rwanda, uh, some of the few countries in Africa that we are not, you know, um, affected badly by, by the pandemic. I mean, compared to South Africa, uh, because I remember during the pandemic, I was in South Africa, I was based in South Africa, and it's really affected them, you know, you know, lots and lots of people were dying. Um, I mean, so that that was how, um, um, you know, it's played out, you know, 2020, 2021, um, as we speak currently, um, we don't have much, you know, regarding the pandemic, you know, we, we've, we've kind of recovered from the shock, from the earlier shock, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, but now um, things are becoming, um, things are going back to normal, like, I mean, people are living as though um, we never had a pandemic, and so... So, uh, so the economy has come back. Exactly. Um, but it's really affected it. So more like, uh, you know, the aftershock, um, kind of recovering from it. And uh, that was how, you know, it's all played out in Nigeria. Okay. Mm, bro, if, if I may add, I think oh, the, 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 the Ukrainian war, uh, I think, uh, had a major impact on the, especially the, the agriculture sector, because uh, you think about uh, collectively, collectively um, African countries, I think, get, you know, 44% of the uh, grains and cereals uh, imports from Russia and Ukraine. And so when the pandemic hit, uh, you saw, especially last year, prices of wheat 
really growing, I think, by more than 60%. Yeah, I'm surprised you're, the, year. you're you know? yeah, <laughs> mentioning inflation. Yeah, yeah. I, wondered, yeah I wondered when we would get to Yeah, that. so it's, it's, uh, it made it worse, especially for countries uh, in the Horn of Africa and part of the West, Af West African countries. They were depending, uh, you know, heavily on uh, imports from uh, Russia and, uh, and Ukraine. Uh, and, and like you said, you're talking about a food crisis right now because uh, when you look at already with p prices had, you know, started getting momentum in 2020. And I think between 2020 and 2022, you saw uh, prices of major fertilizers really uh, grow, uh, increasing you know, trip, more than tripling uh, yeah, in many cases. And what that means is that you have, uh, especially parents in most of African countries, uh, in countries like Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, uh, Rwanda, Nigeria, really choosing between uh, buying fertilizers that they desperately need for their produce and sending, uh, sending their, their children to school. And, uh, uh, it's 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 really it's really uh, it has been a very 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 major issue uh, in Africa. Um, we can of course talk about how countries are navigating that, but I think uh, in terms of impact, it's it's it's, it's a huge impact. Yeah. Can I yeah. add one more thing, a small comment? Please. Um, during the war, Ukraine couldn't export its grain to Africa and other developing countries because Russia used food as a weapon and blackmail, uh, it blocked the Black Sea. Uh, that's why uh, last year Turkey and US, they signed Black, S Black Sea Ukraine Agreement, which was very effective. Uh, Ukraine managed to export at least 30 million tons of grain and other foodstuff to developing countries. But the problem is, and this deal actually yesterday was extended to another few months. But it's very fragile. It's the first deal signed between Ukraine and Russia during the war. But Russia is constantly threatening to um, get out of the deal or to tweak uh, uh, the circumstances that way that will benefit it. So we are in this very, in this limbo where we don't know what will happen next uh, because food is used during the war as a weapon. And and what uh, and what is surprising is that actually Russia was uh, blaming the U.S. sanctions and the European sanctions for that. Uh, but I think we saw the U.S., you know, coming out and saying, no, agricultural commodities are not actually sanctioned. Uh, but because of the blocking of the, uh, you, you know, the Black Sea ports, uh, it was complicated. And I think I remember sometime back the New York Times uh, reporting <laughs> uh, uh, that the U.S. had sent notice to some of the African countries that Russia was actually selling uh, stolen, uh, stolen grains from from Ukraine, so Africa is somehow uh, caught between the east and west. Yeah. Uh, so they have to choose between: can we stop uh, uh, importing the grains that we desperately need, yeah. uh, or you know, like what what do we do? You know, uh, in my opinion, say I would say the moral thing to do is, you know, uh, to stop. Uh, you know, importing uh, this grain. And I think uh, we saw some of the countries really uh, trying to find alternatives. Uh, you know, in my country where you have 64% of the cereals coming from uh, Russia, we stopped to import from Russia, you know. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a delicate uh, uh, thing to do, but yeah. they had to make that decision. Right, when yeah. you're caught in the middle. Okay, James, I want to bring you into the conversation. Um, and then uh, I want to get to at least one or two more topics um, after I ask you basically the same question, which is that uh, the UK has gone through some both, you know, the t pandemic, some economic turmoil. You had a prime minister who was ousted as a result of some of the economic turmoil. Two prime ministers. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I lost track. <laughs> it's easy, easy to lose count. So, um, so why don't you give us uh, a quick overview, and uh, and then we'll we'll start talking about media in each of your countries after that. Okay. So, so the pandemic was catastrophic in Britain as it was everywhere. Um, in some ways, it was surprisingly bad in Britain because Britain should have had quite a good pandemic relatively. Um, it was the country that was supposedly the best prepared. It had the, the very advanced pandemic preparedness program. Lots of money had been put into it. Um, it turned out to be completely useless. You might as well not have bothered. 
Um, and then Britain was the first country to develop a vaccine which worked and was authorised and the first people to be injected with vaccine were in Britain. There was very, very strong cross-party, deep societal uh, support for the vaccine. We didn't have the sort of American anti-vax uh, campaigns taking control of parties. It, was, it remained a very small section of society and yet it was a, a catastrophically bad outcome, very large numbers of deaths, uh, among the worst in Europe, and uh, obviously the economy a disaster. And then in, it, it, that, that, and it was the pandemic that took down the first Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, um, uh, because it turned out that he was making, while he was making the laws restricting everyone's rights to go to parties, he was going to parties. Um, so that didn't, uh, that didn't turn out well for him. Um, and there's some great photos. Um, but uh, after he went, we then moved into Liz Truss uh, for a couple of weeks, um, who was appallingly bad prime minister. Um, uh, I was at university with her and she left absolutely no impact on me whatsoever, in spite of sitting on a committee with her at the time, uh, which doesn't suggest that she was a uh, you know, forceful personality uh, then. Um, anyway, she switched party, eventually managed to become Prime Minister for the Conservatives, um, and uh, virtually destroyed, would have destroyed the economy had she not been, um, had to be forced to reverse all, pretty much all her policies uh, and leave office again. Um, which is which is obviously you know not great, um, but all of that really, her her position was post COVID, um, and the troubles she was trying to deal with were again self imposed by Britain, which is Brexit, um, which is a, an issue obviously no one else had, um, but the UK ended up with this strange economy, which is we got all the bad stuff that hit Europe because of the Ukraine war. So all the supply side troubles, particularly soaring energy crisis, which obviously in the US was not so bad. Um, and then at the same time, Britain had all the inflation problems that the US had um, with wildly low unemployment, um, uh, all the same big switches in demand and so forth. And inflation has turned out to be as high as at the peak in the US, but just hasn't gone down again. Um, so there's a real problem going on in the economy at the moment um, and it's not looking great for the, the third Prime Minister um, but he's got another year to go before he has to face the electorate. <laughs> okay well let's hope it let's hope it goes better for him and that you can maintain some sense of uh, stability. Um, okay quickly because we have 10 minutes um, and with five people, that's two minutes apiece. So I am going to time you. Uh, sorry. Um, but I, you know, one of the things that we talk about is uh, a well functioning press, at least, you know, in the US, we talk about well functioning press leads to a well functioning democracy. And we believe, well, to, to varying degrees, that a well functioning democracy and uh, a capitalist society are a good combo generally for uh, economic outcomes. So uh, with that loose tie-in, I just want to hear from each of you a little bit about um, what it's like to be a journalist right now in your countries. Um, what is the media environment like? Are you, uh, uh, are you finding lots of differences between the US media environment and your respective media environments? Um, and I'm going to start the timer. And time more, let's start with you. Sure. And yeah, in, in Pakistan, this is like, it's it's a very sensitive topic, so I must choose my words carefully because okay. it's live streamed as well. Um, recently, had a journalist who was killed in Kenya. Um, nobody knows, but everybody has a guess who it was. I'm not. I cannot say on really on live stream who I think uh, murdered him. But even right now, there's journalist who is missing. So the media environment in Pakistan is very hostile. There's a line that you cannot cross with certain people, and it comes with undesirable consequences if you do that. Um, so that's 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 like the way they use uh, violence or threat of violence to you know suppress you, and that's that has got to do with the overall uh, lack of rule of law in the country. Um, I think the other um, censorship that comes uh, in journalism, which is particularly harsh in Pakistan, is. Um, the business of running a publication. It's becoming e increasingly difficult to run a, a publication house because of 
um, high inflation costs. Um, you know, in Pakistan, everything is imported. We, we do not have a localized like production. Um, even the ink that we use is imported. So as the dollar goes up, uh, publishing becomes costly. You know, people are not willing to afford that, and as a consequence, um, it actually you know uh, it, it is try it is altering the concept of, of journalism itself because people are then looking for alternate sources of income and. Actually, one of the things that Imran Khan, Prime Minister Imran Khan, uh, did when he came into power was that he cut off. Uh, he he said that he was not going to pay uh, dues to media houses from the previous government. I mean, the previous government was actually one of the biggest uh, ad buyers for media houses. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, economic this economic censorship is. I think it's it's making it more difficult. Well, being a journalist in Ukraine during the war is not fun at all. Just imagine sitting in your apartment during blackouts without light internet, uh, using your neighbor's Starlink for satellite internet. When you hear the air raid alert howling outside, the distant sounds of explosions, the air defense at work, and you're like, I need to go to the bomb shelter. But you cannot because bomb shelters look like cages most of the time and you cannot work from there. So yeah, this is what my routine looks like most of the time. But another more global change, uh, more national change that happened uh, with Ukrainian journalism, it's really hard to find a balance between being a journalist and being a patriot. Because as a journalist in Ukraine, you cannot talk about everything. If it was like a real story from my life, I saw uh, a missile fall into the building uh, across my street. It destroyed it almost completely. And I saw where it happened when it happened. But I couldn't just take a picture and post it because other Russian media, or, or because Russian um, defense, they will see this. They would see this picture and they can strike again. So as a journalist, we are not allowed to post pictures from the places where the missiles fell or where we see our air defense at work. Uh, and the same about counteroffensive uh, about what kind of weapon Ukrainian military uses. It's really hard to find this balance and to know exactly what kind of information you can disclose and what you cannot. Of course, when it comes to corruptions, for instance, because we know that <laughs> corruption during the war is flourishing, it didn't disappear, unfortunately. Um, so when uh, one of the major Ukrainian media reported about the corruption scandal in Ukraine, uh, many people were outraged that it destroys Ukraine's image, uh, it impacts the foreign aid. But we need to talk about these issues. And actually Zelensky, after that, he reaffirmed the procurement of uh, food to soldiers. Uh, it reshuffled the government. So we just need to find this balance uh, of what we can talk about and what we cannot. But most of the time, we choose to tell people stories that matter. Yeah. Gosh, we need Sorry more time. for exceeding your limit. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's OK. Julius, go ahead. Uh, I also have to choose my words very carefully because I still live in my country. And uh, uh, it's, but to be honest, it's not uh, it's not easy to be a journalist, especially in Africa. Uh, uh, nobody cares about you. Uh, nobody cares about your life. Um, so it's not easy. That's for sure. Um, who controls the narrative is you know. It's the government, and uh, uh, most times you find yourself in trouble uh, for reporting about even things that are as as, as simple as you would, you know, uh, imagine. But the other thing is also, uh, it's not just the government, but also corporations uh, uh, in the in the in the in the business uh, news uh, where I am. I think uh, you always always find you know yourself in a lot of trouble reporting about let's say uh corporations that are uh, uh let's say using you know child labor uh in mineral uh, uh resource countries like drc or even zambia um uh, and, and and i must say i think most of the media corporation and media organizations or even the journalists in general uh, we talk about this, you know, corporate capture. I think the media is captured by the 
uh, by you know by the corporates, uh, especially those that have vested interests. Um, and then there's a very big issue about human rights, um, and I think uh, uh, there's a need to um, you know to advocate for the change. Uh, who's supposed to do that? I don't know. You beat the timer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Patrick. Yeah, I mean, so I must say that Nigeria has um, a vibrant, you know, media um, industry, and um, but I must also admit that um, Nigeria is a dangerous place to do journalism, right? Because um, um, I currently have a friend who is on exile, a journalist. I mean, because the government was attacking him and he had to, you know, leave Nigeria. Um, my colleagues have been attacked, you know, detained, um, harassed, and, you know, arrested for, you know, doing their job. Um, so in February, we had our general election, and more than 20 journalists were either arrested or detained or harassed by security forces. Um, and, I mean, just like Julius said, so corporations also, my friend did an investigation two days ago um, about medical negligence by Shell, I mean, which is um, a, a big oil, you know, company, and after the after the investigation was published, um, officials at the company reported his account to Twitter, and he was suspended, uh, restricted, or whatever. Um, I mean, these are part of the challenges, you know. Um, you know, journalists back in Nigeria face. But I mean, despite the challenges, we still have. Um, I mean, my colleagues back at home who are staying back in Nigeria, exposing corruption, and you know, doing their reporting despite you know the attacks, you know, from the government. Um, Media outlets, especially broadcast media outlets, radio and TV, have been either banned or fined, you know, tens of thousands of dollars by the government, um, you know, for embarking on or for producing, you know, reporting that is critical um, of the government. And I, I don't see this changing anytime soon. And I, and I think it ranges from country to country, uh, countries that are a little bit democratic, let's say countries like Kenya, you see the media you know, uh, tending to be more liberal uh, compared to uh, countries where you have autocratic regimes, uh, you know, where you have leaders that have been, you know, in power for so many uh, years. Yeah. All right. James, I imagine it looks a little bit different for you, but you tell us. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't been worried for my life at, in, in any of my reporting. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, we had a survey come out in the US, which is a, a big annual survey of what's the most trusted media. And it always amuses me because the BBC always comes out as the most trusted American publication. And the BBC, of course, is the national broadcaster in the UK. Um, and is, again, very widely trusted, very centrist. Um, we almost have the inverse of the US media scene. So we've got uh, television, which is quite highly regulated, very centrist, very consensus driven in terms of its news um, and we've got a highly partisan newspaper scene um, uh, obviously complete with uh, rough and tumble tabloids which are uh, much more tabloid than the American tabloids um, uh, and uh, but it's not obvious that it's changed a huge amount um, I think it's under pressure from social media the same as in the US but it's it's not clear to me in in you know, 40 years of reading the papers, that they've become more partisan. Um, uh, they obviously have less money, um, the same as newspapers everywhere. Um, so maybe they maybe that affects accuracy. But um, I think that the, if anything, Britain always had highly partisan newspaper media and continues to do so. Um, and America is just sort of discovering it. All right. I think it is. 12.45, so we can move to taking questions from the audience for the last 15 minutes. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh, sorry, there's a microphone coming so we can all hear you. Yeah, I'd love to understand how the journalist in resident program, as well as taking courses at UChicago, has influenced your views and your approach to your work, and then if relevant, your views on economics. Who wants to take this question? Okay, Patrick and Dasha. So, Patrick, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, um, for me, I think um, this is kind of um, um, a kind of a big change for me, like an amazing experience for me. Um, so this is the first time I'm taking business courses, you know, um, you know, sitting with MBA students to audit classes and, you know, um, 
like I've seen the impact, you know, my worldview, and I, I know that definitely this is going to, you know, uh, you know, affect the way and impact, you know, my reporting um, after the fellowship. Um, I mean, and also the networking, like I've met amazing people, um, you know, in my class, and, you know, I've, I have, you know, I've been sitting in classes like with, you know, amazing professors, and they've kind of influenced, you know, the way I see uh, business journalism, you know, reporting the economy and stuff like that. Can you give one example of how you think it might be different when you go back versus like what change you felt you might make? Yeah, so, okay. Um, so I think the way I incorporate like data to my reporting is going to change going forward. And I mean, um, that is from one of the classes that I that I'm taking currently, and that is um, marketing strategy, to be specific. So, you know, um, incorporating data and kind of having um, a shift, you know, from the way you approach, you know, marketing and, you know, um, improving your skills on strategy and, and all that. So it's going to definitely have an impact um, when I go back. Nice. Dasha? For me, it's more of the mindset change. Um, one of my favorite classes here is Perspectives on Capitalism, and we talk and read a lot about capitalism. By a lot, I mean a lot. Um, and I never thought about capitalism in that way. Like Ukraine was under USSR for many decades, and we just started to realize what capitalism means for us and what Western values and economic freedoms means for us. And by talking and reading uh, about capitalism in different countries, I just try to project it in t onto Ukraine and see how it will work for us, how it will change our economy after the war, and what we as a country can even offer, like how we can improve this economic model. Another class I ta take, FinTech Revolution, which is awesome, because Ukraine is a technology hub in Eastern Europe. Our fintech services are much more developed than in many countries. Like I was so surprised that in the US you cannot send money from one bank to another like you need a separate app and in ukraine you can just shake your phone and to send the money that way so yeah like just, it's interesting for me to learn how it's done in various countries yeah uh can i Go add ahead. also um i think i was jokingly telling people back home that you don't realize how dumb you are until you get to the <laughs> university of chicago uh <laughs> <That's true. laughs> it's uh yeah. There's, 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 there's a wealth of knowledge, uh, really, to, uh, you know, sitting in, in those classes with, uh, you know, MBA students. And uh, uh, I think most of us are taking uh, the chronic capitalism class. Uh, I must say, it sort of opens uh, your, 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 your mind to, uh, you know, to look differently uh, at how corporations uh, really work, um, and I realized uh, I thought I always uh, thought America was some of the most amazing country when it comes to corporations, but I realized it's the worst country when it comes to corporations. <laughs> so Do you want to uh, expand on I think that we briefly? need to learn maybe lessons from somewhere else. <laughs> All right, let's take another question. Yeah, In the, yeah, you can pass it. Yeah. Um, so I. I wanted to know um, about alternate media, you know, not mainstream. Um, in your countries, how is it thriving? And what is your personal um, sort of attitude or thought about alternate media in your countries? Is my so question clear? You, you, how, yeah. You're talking about how mainstream media in my country uh, I'm talking about alternate media, not mainstream yeah, media. Mainstream. You know, alternate. I, uh, alternate. independent media. I don't know how you term it. I think I think this. <laughs> uh, speaking from the African perspective, it's hard to say that there's such a thing as independent media. Uh, if that's what you mean by alternate media. Uh, the media is either sponsored by or funded or financed by corporations, governments. Uh, or, you know, uh, other corporations that have, you know, vested interest. Uh, I don't see a lot, a lot of uh, independent media really uh, thriving uh, in that direction. Like I said, except very few countries. You can go to Nigeria, you find, you find some of a few independent 
you know, media company, you can go to Kenya because these are liberal, uh, you know, countries. You can go to South Africa. Uh, you can find that. But uh, in other countries, in many other countries, you don't see that happening, at least from the African perspective. I guess the Kiev Independent is sort of an independent, yeah. and it's in the name. And it was started by, by the way, the, the Kiev Independent was started by a former um, alumni of this program. Yeah, so I started my work at the Kiev Post. It was Ukraine's largest English language newspaper. One day I came to work and uh, realized that all of the journalists were fired because, this is a red alert, by the way. Sorry. Um, it wakes me up every night. Um, what I was, uh -huh. So yeah, I came to work one day and realized that all of the journalists were fired by our oligarch owners because he didn't like how we wrote about uh, corruption in Ukraine. And then um, my team studied Kiev Independent, which is media startup, uh, which is financed by, uh, with grants and uh, our patrons. And we grew very quickly. Uh, the war helped us to do that. And this is like the primary example that independent media can work in Ukraine and can finance itself. And I am tech and cybersecurity reporter. And every tech media in Ukraine is basically a startup. They start from a garage or someone's apartment in the center of Kiev, and they attract investment from angels or people interested in this. And they evolve more like a startup rather than oligarch-owned media, because traditionally Ukrainian media is owned by oligarchs in Ukraine. And we try to abandon this model because it makes us very similar to Russia, where media is controlled either by powerful people or the state. Let's take another question. Uh, yeah, Steph. Um, I do have a question for Dasha. So in your work as a cybersecurity reporter, how have you seen the role of hacking develop during the war? And has that had, like what economic impacts, if any, has, has that had, you know, has it helped the econ economy stabilized to the degree that it could stabilize. You know, so much international coverage focuses on like the weapons that you can see and the missiles and the planes and everything. So I'm wondering, you know, what's there behind the scenes? Thank you so much. No one asked me about cybersecurity here. It's like the most fascinating topic. Uh, so yeah, Ukraine is now in the middle of the cyber war. And it was in the middle of the cyber war since 2016, when if you heard uh, the cyber attack on Petya, which affected companies around the world and caused $10 billion of damages. And right now, businesses suffer from cyber attacks, um, but governments suffer even more. Uh, because in the beginning of the war, Russia deployed the so-called Vipers. This is the kind of malware which destroys all, the, all of the data. And they wanted to destroy Ukrainian uh, critical infrastructure, government infrastructure, digital infrastructure, I mean, by deploying these Vipers. But right now, it changed significantly because Ukraine improved its cyber defense thanks to US partners, to European partners. And now the main objective of cyber war between Ukraine and Russia is to collect as much intelligence as possible. So the kind of malware they deploy, it's the information stealing malware, and they try to leak all of the data um, it's the different kind of leak than we see uh, the Pentagon leak because it was just like the misuse of Discord or something. Um, but yeah, this is dangerous, what is happening, and I think governments should pay more attention to cybersecurity since the cost entailed by cyber attacks it is as detrimental as uh, by physical attacks. And we saw evidence that Russia coordinates some of this um, missile strikes with cyber attacks. For instance, if it wants to attack an uh, energy facility, it starts with a cyber attack to um, make it more chaotic, and then it strikes this energy facility with a uh, missile strike. So yeah, we can consider cyber attacks during the war as a war crime, just like missile strikes and drone attacks. Let's take another question. Um, in the back, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. I wonder if, if each of you can very briefly uh, describe one story that you're excited to work on once you return to your jobs. So, uh, I think for me, yeah. Yeah, sure. go ahead, go ahead. Um, so, I'll, I'll be doing a story on, um, so I'm based out of out of um, Toronto, so, I, um, so I'll be doing a story on 
migrants in, in, in Canada who, um, are, who are working like in unfavorable conditions, like exploitation from their employers, you know. Uh, and I'm talking about migrants from Mexico, from, um, from Africa who work, you know, on farms, you know, owned by Canadians. And, you know, I've spoken with um, a lot of them and their experiences have been, you know, kind of very devastating. They work without um, um, any health care plan, you know, any benefits at all. Um, um, I mean, so what the migrants are kind of facing is that um, they work for employers who are not willing to pay them, you know, the normal minimum wage, like in Canada, for example. Um, so I've pitched the story to my editor and it has been approved. And once I get back, that's the story I'm going to be working on to kind of expose the, um, the treatment, the ill treatment that, you know, migrants, uh, you know, face in, in Canada. I mean, who, I mean, when I was discussing with my friends back in Nigeria that, you know, Canada, mm -hmm. there are migrants who, you know, work you know, in unfavorable conditions, you know, on, on farms and all that, you know, poor treatment from employers, and they were kind of shocked, you know. I mean, because they see Canada as, you know, the dreamland where, you know, nothing bad happens, like to migrants and kind of a migrant country and stuff like that. But, you know, when you are there, you will know that definitely the migrants are kind of facing some challenges. Yeah. So that's the story definitely I'll be jumping on when I get back. Does anybody else want to share? Yeah, well, well. This, um, this, this isn't very international, but since I am a columnist writing about markets for the Wall Street Journal, I'm very excited to uh, be looking at US, uh, the US government um, potential for default um, and about the uh, banking system, um, because, of course, journalists thrive on disaster. <laughs> Any minute? Yeah, go ahead. This is the answer probably no one expects, but... I will be excited to write about quantum computing because I am a quantum computer nerd. And last week we had a lecture with David Oshman, who uh, Oshman, yeah, who teaches here in the University of Chicago. And like, I wrote about cyber about quantum computing a lot when I tried to convince my editor that this actually matters. Uh, so yeah, after talking to David and he agreed to talk to me after the program, I, I will be excited to write something on this topic. Patrick, you haven't answered any questions yet. Do you want to? Um, you want to? Sorry, <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. So I took this course, which Julius was also talking about. It's called Crony Capitalism. It tells you how vested interests work. So um, I've been thinking a lot if Pakistan's vested interest is like, if, is it like a sophisticated vested interest or not? And so I'm after going back, I'll be like focused on researching and writing about if Pakistan's vested interest is breakable and how to break it. <laughs> Just amount to us when it's ready. So. Julius, do you want to... We can I'm end. not killed before. Yes, please, Daisy. Um, yeah. Julius, um, you want to go ahead? I, I, I can't point out uh, one specific story, but I think uh, I've been you know, thinking about a couple of stories, especially uh, I'm not a fan of corporations, to be, to be honest. Um, I think most of the stories that I'm going to be doing uh, is to sort of hold uh, corporations more accountable. Uh, and most of my stories are going to be based on that. Um, you know, things like uh, investigating practices of telecommunications corporations, uh, uh, monopolies in, you know, I mainly cover Eastern African regions, so I'll be looking at uh, monopolies uh, in, in, in different sectors uh, within those countries. And, um, Let's see. All right. I think that was a great question to end on. Um, of course, you can go read uh, all these stories when they come out by following uh, these folks' bylines. Um, and thank you all for coming.